Chapter 4, Part 2 of The Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 4, War and Waiting, Part 2. News of Jackson's swoop began to filter through to both Richmond and Washington. In Richmond they wondered and rejoiced. In Washington they wondered, but did not rejoice. They had not expected there any blow to be struck in the dead of winter, and Lincoln demanded of his generals why they could not do as well. Distance and the vagueness of the news magnified Jackson's exploits and doubled his numbers. Eyes were turned with intense anxiety toward that desolate white expanse of snow and ice, in the midst of which he was operating. Jackson finally turned his steps toward Romney, which had been the Union headquarters, and his men, exhausted and half-starved, once more dragged themselves over the sleety roads. Winter offered a fresh obstacle at every turn. Even the spirits of Harry, who had borrowed so much from the courage of Jackson, sank somewhat. As they pulled themselves through the hills on their last stage toward Romney, he was walking. His horse had fallen three times that day on the ice and was now too timid to carry his owner. So Harry led him. The boy's face and hands were so much chapped and cracked with the cold that they bled at times. But he wasted no sympathy on himself. It was the common fate of the army. Jackson and his generals themselves suffered in the same way. Jackson was walking, too, for a while, leading his own horse. Harry was sent back to bring up the Invincibles, as Romney was now close at hand, and there might be a fight. He found his old colonel and lieutenant colonel walking over the ice. Both were thin and were black under the eyes with privation and anxiety. These were not in appearance the men whom he had known in gay and sunny Charleston, though in spirit the same. They gave Harry a welcome and hoped that the enemy would wait for them in Romney. "'I don't think so,' said Harry, "'but I've orders for you from General Jackson to bring up the Invincibles as fast as possible.' "'Tell General Jackson that we'll do our best,' said Colonel Talbot, as he looked back at his withered column. They seemed to Harry to be withered indeed. They were so gaunt with hardship and drawn up so much with cold. Many wore the blue northern overcoats that they had captured at Bath, and more had tied up their throats and ears in the red woolen comforters of the day, procured at the towns through which they passed. They, too, were gaunt of cheek and black under the eye like their officers. The Invincibles under urging increased their speed, but not much. Little reserve strength was left in them. Langdon and St. Clair, who had been sent along the line, returned to Colonel Talbot, where Harry was still waiting. They're not going as fast as a railroad train, said Langdon in an aside to Harry, but they're doing their best. You can't put in a well more than you can take out of it, and they're marching now not on their strength but their courage. Still, it might be worse. We might all be dead. But we're not dead by a big margin, and I think we'll make another haul at Romney. But old Jack won't let us stay and enjoy it. I never saw a man so much in love with marching. The steeper the hills and mountains, the colder the day, the fiercer the sleet and snow, the better he likes it. The fellow who said General Jackson didn't care anything about our feet told the truth, said St. Clair thoughtfully. The general's not a cruel man, but he thinks more of Virginia and the South and our cause than he does of us. If it were necessary to do so to win, he'd sacrifice us to the last man and himself with us. And never think twice before doing it. You've sized him up, said Harry. The army poured into Romney and found no enemy. Again a garrison had escaped through the mountain snows when the news reached it that Jackson was at hand. But they found supplies of food, filled their empty stomachs, and, as Langdon had foretold, quickly started anew in search of another enemy elsewhere. But the men finally broke down under the driving of the merciless Jackson. Many of them began to murmur. They had left the bleeding trail of their feet over many an icy road, and some said they were ready to lie down in the snow and die before they would march another mile. A great depression, which was physical rather than mental, a depression born of exhaustion and intense bodily suffering, seized the army. Jackson, although with a will of steel, was compelled to yield. Slowly and with reluctance, he led his army back toward Winchester, leaving a large garrison in Romney. But Harry knew what he had done, although nothing more than skirmishes had been fought. He had cleared a wide region of the enemy. He had inspired enthusiasm in the South, and he had filled the North with alarm. The great movement of McClellan on Richmond must be aware of its right flank. A dangerous foe was there who might sting terribly, and men had learned already that none knew when or whence Jackson might come. A little more than three weeks after their departure, Harry and his friends and the army, except the portion left in garrison at Romney, 
returned to Winchester, the picturesque and neat little Virginia city so loyal to the South. It looked very good indeed to Harry as he drew near. He liked the country, rolling here and there, the hills crested with splendid groves of great trees. The little north mountain, a looming blue shadow to the west, and the high Massanutton peaks to the south seemed to guard it round. And the valley itself was rich and warm with the fine farms spread out for many miles. Despite the engrossing pursuit of the enemy and of victory and glory, Harry's heart thrilled at the sight of the red brick houses of Winchester. Here came a period of peace, so far as war was concerned, but of great anxiety to Harry and the whole army. The government at Richmond began to interfere with Jackson. It thought him too bold, even rash, and it wanted him to withdraw the garrison at Romney, which was apparently exposed to an attack by the enemy in great force. It was said that McClellan had more than 200,000 men before Washington, and an overwhelming division from it might fall at any time upon the southern force at Romney. Harry, being a member of Jackson's staff, and having become a favorite with him, knew well his reasons for standing firm. January, which had furnished so fierce a month of winter, was going. The icy country was breaking up under swift thaws, and fields and destroyed roads were a vast sea of mud, in which the feet of infantry, the hoofs of horses, and the wheels of cannon would sink deep. Jackson did not believe that McClellan had enough enterprise to order a march across such an obstacle, but, recognizing the right of his government to expect obedience, he sent his resignation to Richmond. Harry knew of it, his friends knew of it, and their hearts sank like plummets in a pool. Another portion of the Invincibles had been drawn off to reinforce Johnston's army before Richmond, as they began to hear rumors now that McClellan would come by sea instead of land, and their places were filled with more recruits from the Valley of Virginia. Scarcely a hundred of the South Carolinians were left, but the name, the Invincibles, and the chief officers stayed behind. Jackson had been unwilling to part with Colonel Talbot and Lieutenant Colonel St. Hilaire, experienced and able West Pointers. Langdon and St. Clair also stayed. Harry talked over the resignation with these friends of his, and they showed an anxiety not less than his own. It had become evident to the two veteran West Pointers that Jackson was the man. Close contact with him had enabled them to read his character and immense determination. "'I hope that our government at Richmond will decline this resignation and give him a free hand,' said Colonel Talbot to Harry. "'It will be a terrible loss if you are permitted to drop out of the army. I tell you for your own private ear that I have taken it upon me to write a letter of protest to President Davis himself. I felt that I could do so, because Mr. Davis and myself were associated closely in the Mexican War.' The answer came in time from Richmond. Stonewall Jackson was retained, and a freer hand was given to him. Harry and all his comrades felt an immense relief, but he did not know until long afterward how near the Confederacy had come to losing the great Jackson. Benjamin, the Secretary of War, and President Davis both were disposed to let him go, but the powerful intervention of Governor Letcher of Virginia induced them to change their minds. Moreover, hundreds of letters from leading Virginians who knew Jackson well poured in upon him, asking him to withdraw the resignation. So it was arranged, and Jackson remained, biding his time for the while at Winchester, until he could launch the thunderbolt. A pleasant month for Harry, and all the young staff officers, passed at Winchester. The winter of intense cold had now become one of tremendous rain. It poured and it poured, and it never ceased to pour. Between Winchester and Washington and McClellan's great army was one vast flooded area, save where the hills and mountains stood but in Winchester the southern troops were warm and comfortable. It was a snug town within its half-circle of mountains. Its brick and wooden houses were solid and good. The young officers, when they went on errands, trod on pavements of red brick, and oaks and elms and maples shaded them nearly all the way. When Harry, who went oftenest on such missions, returned to his general with the answers, he walked up a narrow street where the silver maples, which would soon begin to bud under the continuous rain, grew thickest, and came to a small building in which other officers like himself wrote at little tables, or waited in full uniform to be sent upon like errands. If it were yet early, he would find Jackson there, but if it were late, he would cross a little stretch of grass to the parsonage, the large and solid house, where the Presbyterian minister, Dr. Graham, lived, and where Jackson, with his family, who had joined him, now made his home in this month of waiting. It was here that Harry came one evening late in February. It had been raining as usual, and he wore one of the long Union overcoats captured at Bath, blue then, but a faded grayish-brown now. However, the gray Confederate uniform beneath it was neat and looked fresh. 
Harry was always careful about his clothing, and the example of St. Clair inspired him to greater efforts. Besides, there was a society in Winchester, including many handsome young women of the old Virginia families, and even a budding youth who was yet too young for serious sentimentalism could not ignore its existence. It was twilight, and the cold rain was still coming down steadily, as Harry walked across the grass, and looked out of the wet dusk at the manse. Lights were shining from every window, and there was warmth around his heart. The closer association of many weeks with Jackson had not only increased his admiration, but also had given the general a great place in the affection that a youth often feels for an older man whom he deems a genius or a hero. Harry walked upon a little portico, and taking off the overcoat, shook out the raindrops. Then he hung it on a hook against the wall of the house. The door was open six inches or so, and a ribbon of brilliant light from within fell across the floor of the portico. Harry looked at the light and smiled. He was young, and he loved gaiety. He smiled again when he heard within the sound of laughter. Then he pushed the door farther open and entered. Now the laughter rose to a shout, and it was accompanied by the sound of footsteps. A man, thick of hair and beard, was running down a stairway. Perched high upon his shoulders was a child of three or four years, with both hands planted firmly in the thick hair. The small feet crossed over the man's neck, kicked upon his chest, but he seemed to enjoy the sport as much as the child did. Harry paused and stood at attention until the man saw him. Then he saluted respectfully and said to General Jackson, I wish to report to you, sir, that I delivered the order to General Garnett, as you directed, and here, sir, is his reply. He handed a note to the general, who read it, thrust it into his pocket, and said, That ends your labors for the day, Lieutenant Kenton. Come in now and join us. He picked up the child again, and carrying it in his arms, led the way into an inner room, where he gave it to a nurse. Then they passed into the library, where Dr. Graham, several generals, and two or three of Winchester's citizens were gathered. All gave Harry a welcome. He knew them well, and he looked around with satisfaction at the large room, with its rows and rows of books, bound mostly in dark leather, volumes of theology, history, essays, poetry, and of the works of Walter Scott and Jane Austen. Jackson himself was a rigid Presbyterian, and he and Dr. Graham had many a long talk in this room on religion and other topics almost equally serious. But tonight they were in a bright mood. A mountaineer had come in with four huge wild turkeys, which he insisted upon giving to General Jackson himself, and guests had been asked in to help eat them. Nearly twenty people sat around the minister's long table. The turkeys, at least enough for present needs, were cooked beautifully, and all the succulent dishes which the great Virginia valleys produced so fruitfully were present. General Jackson himself, at the request of the minister, said grace, and he said it so devoutly and so sincerely that it always impressed the hearers with a sense of its reality. It was full dusk, and the rain was beating on the windows, when the black attendants began to serve the guests at the great board. Several ladies, including the general's wife, were present. The room was lighted brilliantly, and a big fire burned in the wide fireplace at the end. To Harry, three seats away from General Jackson, there was a startling contrast between the present moment and that swift campaign of theirs through the wintry mountains where the feet of the soldiers left bloody trails on the ice and snow. It was a curious fact that for a few instants the mountain and the great cold were real and this was but fancy. He looked more than once at the cheerful faces and the rosy glow of the fire, before he could convince himself that he was in truth here in Winchester, with all this comfort, even luxury, around him. Sitting next to him was a lady of middle age, Mrs. Howard, of prominence in the town, and a great friend of the Grahams. Harry realized suddenly that while the others were talking he had said nothing, and he felt guilty of discourtesy. He began an apology, but Mrs. Howard, who had known him very well since he had been in Winchester, learning to call him by his first name, merely smiled, and the smile was at once maternal and somewhat sad. "'No apologies are needed, Harry,' she said in a low tone that the others might not hear. "'I read your thoughts.' They were away in the mountains with a marching army. All this around us speaks of home and peace, but it cannot last. All of you will be going soon. That's true, Mrs. Howard. I was thinking of march and battle, and I believe you're right in saying that we'll all go soon. That is what we're for. She smiled again a little sadly. You're a good boy, Harry, she said, and I hope that you and all your comrades will come back in safety to Winchester. But that is enough croaking from an old woman, and I'm ashamed of myself. Did you ever see a happier crowd than the one gathered here? Not since I was in my father's house when the relatives would come to help us celebrate Christmas. When did you hear from your father? asked Mrs. Howard, whose warm sympathies had caused Harry to tell her of his life and of his people whom he had left behind in Kentucky. 
just after the terrible disaster at Donelson. He was in the fort, but he escaped with Forrest's cavalry, and he went into Mississippi to join the army under Albert Sidney Johnston. He sent a letter for me to my home, Pendleton, under cover to my old teacher, Dr. Russell, who forwarded it to me. It came only this morning. How does he talk? Hopefully, though he made no direct statement. I suppose he was afraid to do so, lest the letter fall into the hands of the Yankees, but I imagine that General Johnston's army is going to attack General Grant's. If General Johnston can win a victory, it will help us tremendously, but I fear that man Grant. They say that he had no more men at Donelson than we, but he took the fort and its garrison. It's true. Our affairs have not been going well in the West. Harry was downcast for a few moments. Much of their Western news had come through the filter of Richmond, but despite the brighter color that the government tried to put on it, it remained black. Forts and armies had been taken. Nothing had been able to stop Grant. But youth again came to Harry. He could not resist the bright light and the happy talk about him. Bitter thoughts fled. General Jackson was in fine humor. He and Dr. Graham had started to discuss a problem in Presbyterian theology in which both were deeply interested, but they quickly changed it in deference to the younger and lighter spirits about them. Harry had never before seen his general in so mellow a vein. Perhaps it was the last blaze of the home-loving spirit before entering into that storm of battle which henceforth was to be his without a break. The general, under urging, told of his life as an orphan boy in his uncle's rough home in the Virginia wilderness, how he had been seized once by the wanderlust, then so strong in nearly all Americans, and how he and his brother had gone all the way down the Ohio to the Mississippi, where they had camped on a little swampy island, earning their living by cutting wood for the steamers on the two rivers. "'How old were you then, General?' asked Dr. Graham. The older of us was only twelve, but in those rough days boys matured fast and became self-reliant at a very early age. We did not run away. There wasn't much opposition to our going. Our uncle was sure that we'd come back alive, and though we arrived again in Virginia, five or six hundred miles from our island in the river, all rags and filled with fever, we were not regarded as prodigal sons. It was what hundreds, yes thousands of other boys did. In our pleasant uplands we soon got rid of both rags and fever. "'And you did not wish to return to the wilderness?' "'The temptation was strong at times, but it was defeated by other ambitions. "'There was school, and I liked sports. "'These soon filled up my life.' "'Harry knew much more about the life of Jackson, "'which the modesty of his hero kept him from telling. "'Looking at the strong, active figure of the man so near him, "'he knew that he had once been delicate, "'doomed in childhood, as many thought, to consumption inherited from his mother.' but a vigorous life in the open air had killed all such germs. He was a leader in athletic sports. He was a great horseman, and often rode as a jockey for his uncle in the horse races which the open-air Virginians loved so well, and in which they indulged so much. He could cut down a tree or run a sawmill, or drive four horses to a wagon, or seek deer through the mountains with the sturdiest hunter of them all. And upon top of this vigorous boyhood had come the long and severe training at West Point, the most thorough and effective military school the world has ever known. Harry did not wonder, as he looked at his general, that he could dare and do so much. He might be awkward in appearance, he might wear his clothes badly, but the boy at ten years had been a man, doing a man's work and with a man's soul. He had come into the field no parade soldier, but with a body and mind as tough and enduring as steel, the whole surcharged and heated with a spirit of fire. Both Harry and Mrs. Howard had become silent and were watching the general. For some reason Jackson was more moved than usual. His manner did not depart from its habitual gravity. He made no gestures, but the blue eyes under the heavy brows were irradiated by a peculiar flashing light. The long dinner went on. It was more of a festival than a banquet, and Harry at last gave himself up entirely to its luxurious warmth. The foreboding that their mellow days in the pleasant little city were over was gone, but it was destined to come again. Now, after the dinner was finished and the great table was cleared away, they sat and talked, some in the dining room and some in the library. It was still raining, that cold rain which at times turns for a moment or two to snow, and it dashed in gusts against the window panes. Harry was with some of the younger people in the library, where they were playing at games. The sport lagged presently, and he went to a window, where he stood between the curtain and the glass. He saw the outside dimly, the drenched lawn and the trees beyond, under which two or three sentinels, wrapped closely in heavy coats, walked to and fro. He gazed at them idly, and then a shadow passed between him and them. 
He thought at first that it was a blurring of the glass by some stronger gust of rain, but the next moment his experience told him that it could not be so. He had seen a shadow, and the shadow was that of a man, sliding along against the wall of the house in order that he might not be seen by a sentinel. Harry's suspicions were up and alive in an instant. In this border country, spies were numerous. It was easy to be a spy where people looked alike and spoke the same language with the same accent. His suspicions, too, centered at once upon Shepard, whom he knew to be so daring and skillful. The lad was prompt to act. He slipped unnoticed into the hall, put on his greatcoat, felt of the pistol in his belt, opened the front door, and stepped out into the dark and the rain. End of chapter 4, part 2